Let me now turn to problems today, because these questions I've raised are not just Cold War history. They are present today, and I will show this today by looking at nuclear South Asia. First, I discussed preventive war before. Now, 1986, the Indian government had a primitive nuclear capability and the um, Pakistanis did not. And so you had a particular crisis, what was called the brass tax crisis in 1986, 1987, where General K. Sundar Darji, chief of staff of the Indian Army, put Indian military forces on a high state of alert and pushed them right up against the Pakistani border in the Punjab. In response, fearing that India was about to launch an attack, the Pakistani alerted their forces, facing them and even further north, to do a counterattack. And it took very high level political uh, communications to get both sides to stop the alert and pull forces back. What caused this crisis? It was not simply a um, miscommunication or a exercise that got out of control. As P.N. Hoon, the deputy commander to General Sundarji later wrote, what remained a suspicion all along is now being revealed to be true. Brass tax was not just a military exercise, it was a plan to build up a fourth war. What's even more shocking is the Prime Minister, Raj Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, was not aware of these plans. What you see here is Rajiv Gandhi um, shaking hands with General Sundarji during the crisis. And afterwards, when Rajiv Gandhi ordered the Indian military to move backwards, Sundarji remarked, the young boy is just chickened out. He had advocated an attack on Pakistan in order to be able to create a condition that India could destroy the Pakistani nuclear capabilities before they were finally built. He was overruled, but again, it's a point that military forces might want to engage in preventive war even if their civilians don't. A phenomenon that we saw in Twining and the JCS advisors, we saw it in General Anderson during the Cold War, and you see it with General Sundarji in brass tacks. So now let's turn to an event that occurs in 1999, the Cargo War, which is both a conflict that is a, um, cuts against democratic peace theory and also against nuclear peace or nuclear stability theory. There is a widespread belief among political scientists and many politicians that democracies don't fight one another. There's also belief among some political scientists, the nuclear optimists, that nuclear weapon states don't fight each other. As Devin Haggerty, a tremendous political scientist once wrote, there's no more ironclad rule in international relations than this, that nuclear states don't fight wars with, with each other. Or as Jack Levy, another prominent political scientist has written, the absence of war between democracies comes as close as anything we have to an empirical law in international relations. The 1999 cargo war in which over a thousand people, an estimated 474 Indians and 700 Pakistanis, or 1,174 battle deaths occur, is actually evidence against both of those particular theories. Here you have first the evidence about whether Pakistan and India were democratic. This slide shows what in political science we call the polity four data set, showing that the democracy scores, threshold usually being seven, as a state being uh, democratic enough. In 1999, Pakistan was at a seven, and India was at nine, and yet nonetheless, they went to war. Why did that occur? Well, you need to look at the civil-military relations and decision-making in Cargill. The first major decision was to cross the line of control. 
This is the border, or the informal border, between Indian-held Kashmir and Pakistan Kashmir. And before the war occurred, Pakistanis moved a number of military forces disguised as Mujahideen, that is, disguised as guerrilla forces, across the line of control into Indian-held Kashmir so they could shoot down at Indian forces and stop the Indians from reinforcing their capabilities further north. This clear invasion is a violation of uh, international law to cross into Indian-held Kashmir. And since it produced a war, a violation of the uh, so-called democratic peace theory. Two eyewitnesses at the meeting in which Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif made the decision with General, then General, uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, General Musharraf, Professor Musharraf, um, noted that even when the Prime Minister approved of this operation, there was no actual mentioning of the troops that were crossing the line of control. Indeed, they said that Musharraf just told the Prime Minister that he was going to increase the level of militant activity in Kashmir. The discussion was framed in terms of the insurgency in Kashmir. The Army failed to disclose the role of the Northern Light Infantry, that is, that Pakistani military was going to cross the line of control. So when the Prime Minister said, and the Army got the agreement to go and increase the heat in Kashmir, the Prime Minister himself did not know what he had approved of. This has been confirmed by Lieutenant General Jasmit Kiat in a Dawn interview in 2008, where he said that during the crisis, Sharif stated that he was trying to avoid a nuclear war, and that India was getting ready to launch a full-scale military operation against Pakistan that Sharif was really concerned about what the steps were that he had taken, and he wasn't fully aware of what had happened. So again, this was a very difficult crisis. Now, the stability-instability paradox is also illustrated here. Neil Jock, a political scientist who's worked inside the government and U.S. lab system, had noted that what Tom Schilling called the creation of brinksmanship, of trying to create some risk, again occurs in the 1999 crisis. And his interpretation is that perhaps the Pakistani government is just doing what the United States did by creating a risk that leaves something to chance. And there's some truth here, but I'd like to point out one extra factor, is that in this case, this wasn't just a case of a government taking a risk. It was a case of one part of the government putting its foot on the accelerator, the military trying to move forward, and the civilians trying to put their foot on the brake, and both sides fighting for control of the missile. This was a very risky position, and one that I think does not um, argue well. Now let me turn to a related point about Indian and Pakistani nuclear doctrine, because today, Pakistan has said that it will create a risk that if India ever crosses into Pakistani soil, that they will use nuclear weapons. And India claims that if Pakistan ever uses nuclear weapons against India, even if they use nuclear weapons inside Pakistani soil against Indian conventional forces, India will have massive retaliation. Pakistan says the Indians are not credible. They're not going to use nuclear weapons if we use them first along the border against Indian troops. The Indians say they're not, the Pakistani forces are incredible. Their doctrine is not credible. And when two sides are engaged in constant conflict, and there are terrorist incidents across the border and threats to retaliate conventionally, and both sides claim that the other side is not credible. This is not a situation that produces much stability. An additional problem that we saw with nuclear weapons during the Cold War was how hard it is sometimes to produce secure second strike forces. 
Here you see a photograph of the, um, the Pakistani Air Force's Sargodia Air Force Base. Pakistan, because it's concerned about the security of its nuclear weapons, normally keeps its weapons at a base, keep them under lock and guard, and yet they have every incentive, if they fear that a war might occur, to move them off of that um, base where they could be targeted by Indian armed forces. That makes them less vulnerable to an Indian attack, but makes them more vulnerable to terrorist seizure, either through an insider or someone finding the weapons in a less secure condition, going along roads or hiding in the Pakistani countryside. And indeed, you find that this is exactly what the Pakistanis did. In 1999, according to a Washington Post article, military officers during the Kargil campaign secretly contacted Taliban officials about moving nuclear assets into Afghanistan for safekeeping. A Pakistani general familiar with the activity told the Post the operation was actively discussed with the Taliban after some indications emerged that India might open hostilities at the eastern border. The Taliban accepted the request with open arms. Now, I don't believe that that operation actually ever took place. That's the good news. But the bad news is that it was considered. Indeed, in June 2003, uh, President Musharraf was once asked by Ted Koppel on the ABC uh, show Nightline, what's the risk that nuclear weapons could fall into unfriendly hands? On a confidence rating, Koppel asked, of 1 to 100, with 100 being perfect, how would you like to pick a number? And Musharraf said, I certainly would give it over 90. I'm very sure of it. It seems to me that 10% probability of a terrorist seizing a weapon is not a very good one. Have nuclear weapons produced a revolution that creates secure second strike forces and stable mutually assured destruction? Nuclear weapons have had significant influence on international politics. They've changed the game of direct application of power in crises to competitions and risk taking. And nuclear deterrence can produce, in theory, stable deterrence, but as I've shown, Nuclear deterrence may be simple in logic or in theory, but it's very complex in practice. And the reason for that is that nuclear weapons are not controlled by perfect states or perfect leaders. They're controlled by imperfect organizations where things can go wrong, where biases can produce poor decisions. Nuclear weapons may induce caution, but they can also produce risk-taking behavior. Relying on nuclear deterrence, in my view, for your security is therefore like walking on thin ice. The fact that the United States and the Soviet Union did it successfully during the Cold War should not be an excuse to continue doing it forever. And the success of nuclear deterrence in the Cold War should not let you think that other states acquiring nuclear weapons will necessarily walk on that thin ice with safety.